Oh, yeah. Okay, let's turn to First uh, Samuel 16. First Samuel 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Because Samuel's really upset over what has happened here. He said, how long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and mm. go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now we're getting back on track, aren't we? And uh, now there's going to follow God, and God has planned for David to be the king. And uh, we're going to see how this happens. First of all, he's to go to Bethlehem. Now remember, Bethlehem means the house of bread. The house of bread. Remember when, when Naomi came back to Bethlehem last week, she came back to the place where there was bread, where there was supply. And uh, I think it's interesting that that's mm -hmm. the name for that. And that's, of course, then where not only was David born, but of course, then later Jesus was. So they go to Bethlehem. And uh, it's so interesting. We won't take time to read all this, but uh, they go to the house of Jesse. And uh, he says, you know, uh, do you have sons? And he said, uh, yes, you know, he has sons. Actually, over in chapter 17, verse 12, if you want to skip over there real quick. Uh, chapter 17, verse 12, it says, Now David was the son of an, of an Ephrathite, the, of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. Okay, so remember that. Jesse mm. has eight sons. Okay, now go back over to chapter 16. So Samuel goes there, and he says to Jesse, I need to have your sons come. God has not told him which son. Not giving him a name. He said, I will show you, didn't he? So he goes there and look at verse 6. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Well, he was the oldest. So, you know, sometimes you just automatically look at what you think is going to be God's choice. So he looked at him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Mm. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? At the heart. On the heart. Now, it's difficult for you and I to see the heart often, isn't it? We often look at the outward appearance. We often say, oh man, he just looks like this is the right one or she's the right one because of the way they look. And uh, God is the only oh, one who can really geez. see the heart. And so he says, no, that's not the right one. Go down to verse 10. Um, and Jesse made seven. How many sons did he have? Eight. 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 But he brings seven of his sons, passed before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. He said, it's, he's not here. And then he says, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, Yes, there remains the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. He's the youngest, number one. He isn't mature yet, evidently. Now, this is all in Jesse's thinking, see. He's too young. He isn't mature. He's just the sheep herder. He's out with the sheep. He may have thought that he didn't want him to come in because, you know, he wouldn't be presentable. I mean, he'd, been, you know, he'd be kind of stinky and whatnot, you know, out there with the sheep and so on. And so he's not, can't be the right choice. But it's interesting, God what, is looking for the heart. Now, what has David been doing out there with the sheep? Protecting Lots of preparation. Protecting We're going to see that. The best psalmist in the entire Bible was who? David. 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 And I believe that David had been singing out there in the, shep in the pasture for years, writing songs to God, learning about how to handle sheep. And who are we? Sheep. sheep. And I, I, that's another whole, whole situation. Sheep are among the dumbest of animals, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm an old farmer, I know. <laughs> okay, so look at verse 12. So he sat and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. That means that he was probably uh, a, had a kind of a ruddy complexion. He'd been out in the sun. Maybe he was a little sunburned. But he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. <laughs> so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Now that's what you want in a leader. 
mm. isn't it? The spirit of the Lord. I don't care how great they look or how much wealth they have or how what great personality or great presentation they have or whatever. If they don't have the anointing of God, forget it. The anointing is what is going to make the difference, isn't it? So we find here that David is anointed. Now look at verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and leave. Come and leave. The Holy Spirit would be on people for a certain anointing or for a certain position or something or other, but then leave. It was only at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and remained. Because you remember when Jesus was baptized even, the Holy Spirit came on him like a dove, the Bible says, and remained. So you see, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed, I should say, anointed of the Holy Spirit from his baptism on, never having it left. But when we receive the Holy Spirit, he will not leave. He comes and he remains. Because the Holy Spirit is the presence of God here on the earth today. But in the Old Testament, that was not true. The Holy Spirit would come and leave, come and leave. So the a evil spirit comes on Saul in place of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And then it tells us that we go on here, and it tells us that this, whole, this evil spirit would torment him. He would just be under torment. That would mean that very possibly he'd have horrible dreams, think bad thoughts. Today, he, you know, he would probably get into like cutting and, and, you know, different things that the demonic mm. spirits could do with people. Oh. And the only relief he had was for David to come and sing to him. Mm. And he found out that David was a psalmist. And he could play the harp, and David would come, and the anointing was on David, wasn't it? And so the presence of God would come, and that would relieve Saul. Now, Saul still came. He still came. But David would come and you know, minister to him, and he was refreshed, the Bible tells us. So we see here, I want you to see who David is. I mean, he's just young, probably 16 or 17 years old at this point. And I want you to see who he is. He's a shepherd. Now, this is very important. He's a shepherd. He understands sheep. He knows how to lead. You led sheep. You did not drive them. You led them. He's a musician. He knows how to worship. He knows how to sing God, songs to God. He knows how to quiet somebody else. He's a king, isn't he? He's already been anointed king. Now, he has no position as such yet, but he has that anointing, that understanding of leadership. And he's a warrior. We're going to see this in this next chapter. Now we go to chapter 17. Now, everything is in bad shape here because, like we said, the Philistines are the continual uh, uh, enemies of the day. By the way, the Philistines lived in what is today the Gaza Strip. And a lot of times people just don't really quite know where were these Philistines. Actually, they lived right along the coastline uh, south of Tel Aviv, what is today Tel Aviv, uh, in that area along what is today kind of uh, in a way uh, close to what is the Gaza Strip. And they were a very warlike, uh, idolatrous kind of people. So they are at battle now with Israel. Chapter 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they and chose this place. And it's down, it's called a valley. It's called a valley. It's near uh, what is today the Gaza Strip in that, in that area. And they have a warrior, so to speak, in verse 4. It says there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, we all know the story of Goliath. You know, we've read that probably since we were little kids. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful story that, that children like to hear. Some people say that this height in cubits was nine feet, nine inches, which is really tall. And I also read that some people think that was 13 feet. Now, 13 feet would be quite a giant, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? He, he, was, he was big. He was big. His armor weighed 194 pounds. So he'd have to be a big guy to carry that kind of armor around, uh, you know, because it was, it was heavy. His spear weighed 23 pounds. Now, I couldn't even lift a 10-pound spear, probably, to do any damage as though I could do any damage to throw it. 
<laughs> but uh, you know, a spear weighing 23 pounds, I mean, that would, be a, that would be pretty big. In other words, he was really intimidation, right? I mean, you know, we talk about Goliath and we can picture this big giant, but you know the enemy comes to us lots of times not as Goliath, but as intimidation. Anything that's going to just appear that looks big and fierce and like you have no power. Mm -hmm. And so this is the giant that comes out. Now he comes out and of course explains about what he looks like and everything. Go down to the last part of verse eight. He comes out and he yells and he says, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants. In other words, he's proposing a duel, mm -hmm. isn't he? He's proposing that he'll come out as the champion of the Philistines and then they send somebody out and they'll have this duel and whoever wins, is, wins the battle. And the others, of course, have to become their servants. Well, the, the Israelites are just paralyzed. They're just paralyzed. I mean, they don't have anybody that, that big. Saul's tall. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He's the king, yeah. He's out there, He's, they're in the camp, but he's scared to death. And so they don't, you know, they don't know what to do. So we find that there is tremendous fear. Now it tells us here that this went on for 40 days. You know, 40 is always the number of t testing, testing. And lots of times, you know, it seems like things go on and on and on. And oftentimes it's about 40 days that there is a testing. Think about the children of the wild in the wilderness for 40 years, you know. Um, 40 days is a long time, and they were out there and, and nothing was, they were just a stalemate. So, David comes along, and, um, well, let me go on down here. Let me read verse 10, verse 10. The Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And that word dismayed is much, much stronger than you might think. I mean, they were terrified. They were paralyzed. Okay, so the brothers of David are at this battle. They're out there because all good Israelite men would be there. And of course, David's the, still the, the shepherd. And so his father sends David out with some provision. Now, they did not have, you know, meals furnished by the army and that kind of thing. So the families would come and, and feed the, the, the warriors. And so David comes with food for his brothers. So let's go down to verse 22. Verse 22. So David comes out and he uh, brings the, the food to his brothers. Verse 22, it says, And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. He finds them. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out from the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard them. Now there's the key. David heard what that guy said, what that Goliath said. And he is just incensed over this. I mean, he is just really, really upset about this. And he says, well, what's the reward for whoever does this duel? Is there a reward? Now, there would be. I mean, any kind of duel in that day, there would be a reward. And so they report to him that uh, whoever gets the, the, whoever wins will get, you know, much, much in the way of wealth and Saul's daughter to marry. And evidently, she's very beautiful. That would be a good good thing to have happened. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, any young man would be excited about that, I guess. So in verse 26, verse 26, David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Mm. Now David is not here as excited about the reward as he is incensed over the fact that this giant is coming out and defying the God of Israel. Has any of the rest of them thought of that? Evidently not. And David, who has been singing psalms and worshiping God and knowing God, and God has seen David's heart, that's why he has placed him as king, 
he says this this should not be you know this should not be that's why he's really upset so he reports he says this and it gets reported to Saul that David is out there saying you know this is not right this should not happen so Saul comes around verse 32 says David said to Saul let no man's heart fail because of of him your servant he's saying me will go and fight with the Philistine. Now I'm sure Saul looks down his nose at David, who would be much shorter, like, who do you think you are? You're just a kid. You know, we sometimes get that impression of somebody else. You're just a kid, you know. I mean, I'm the king here. What, what you know, who do you think you are? And, and Saul said to him, verse 33, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. Have you ever heard that? You're not able. You can't do that. Who is it that usually tells us that? The devil. Or well, maybe he speaks through somebody else. You know, he'll speak through somebody else. But, you know, that's what we usually hear, isn't it? Well, who do you think you are? You can't do that. Or you'll hear it yourself, just right in your head. You can't do that. You can't do that. Oh man, how many times did I, did I think that when the Lord was calling me into ministry? <laughs> no, I can't do that. No, I'm, I'm, no, no. I've never been to Bible school. I can't do that. I've said that so many times. Praise God. I don't say it anymore. <laughs> and so uh, David goes on. Look what he says in verse 34. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and killed him. I mean, my goodness, I don't know. Have any of you caught a lion by a beard and done battle with him? Well, David had, he evidently. He says, your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. See, David keeps going back to that. Mm. He is not, this is not he right. He, he cannot defy the armies of the living God. We have God on our side. That's what David's saying, isn't it? Mm. What's the matter with you people? <laughs> and uh, so David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, he's just been told he couldn't do it. And what's he saying? I will deliver Israel from the hand of this Philistine. I will do it. Because David knew who was on his side. See, in a sense, David is reviewing what he has done in his past. He knows that God was with him. I mean, I don't know how anybody could kill a lion with their bare hands unless God was on their side. Or a bear. And you see, David had had this experience being out there with the sheep. He was a shepherd. He had to do this to protect the sheep. And so he's saying, I can do this because I know the one who's with me. And of course, what is being said to him is that you're not able. But we have to remember whose side God's on. Whose side God's on. Verse 37, where he says that the Lord will deliver him. You see, that is his testimony. That's his testimony. I've had this happen to me. We all have a testimony. At various things. I, when I can remember so many, many times I have prayed with people who have had a breast cancer or a lump in their breast because I was healed of that. And I know that I know that I know that it was God. Mm -hmm. It was God. So I feel like, you know, that's something that I personally can really believe God for. And many times you go through things in your own life because then that gives you a testimony that gives you the strength and the power to pray for somebody else. If anybody has a rebellious daughter, man, oh man, you know I will pray. I will pray. My daughter was in total rebellion for 15 years, and most of you know the story. Prison, suicide, the whole bit. And today she is serving God with all of her heart. Praise now. God. You just hang in there. You hang in there. And once you've won that battle, then you know it can be won for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so lots of times God allows us to go through things so that then we will have that kind of a testimony to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
my brother-in-law was an alcoholic and we prayed for him we prayed for him and he got delivered and today is serving god he loves to pray for other alcoholics mm. see you, you know you have something you have sometimes in your own life is so that you then will have a testimony that then you can share with somebody else so let's go on here down to verse um 38. so saul clothed David with his armor. He thought, well, young man, you've surely got to have honor, armor on him. So he put on his helmet and so forth and so on. Well, you can imagine, Saul is probably a head taller than David, and, uh, and it didn't fit. <laughs> and so David said to Saul in verse 39, he said, I cannot go with these, for I am not used to them. Now, that's really an interesting little part here, because sometimes I think we want to grab onto somebody else's anointing. Oh, I'll just, I'll, I'll be with them. I'll put my hand on them and then I'll pray for this person. <laughs> you know, we, we want somebody else's anointing, but it doesn't fit. I shall never forget the first time Marilyn sent me out to teach. Marilyn Hickey, you know, who's my mentor. And she said, Ruth, you can use my notes. And I thought, oh, good, great. She, I know she's got great notes. I remember I went and I couldn't make head nor tail. I couldn't figure out what in the world she was talking about. It was horrible. It was horrible. And I remember I came back and she said, well, how was it? And I said, Marilyn, it was terrible. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't follow your notes. It didn't make any sense. She said, good. She said, then you know you've got to do your own. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be much easier. <laughs> but that didn't work, that didn't work. So you cannot grab onto somebody else's anointing. You have to seek God for your own, for your own. You have to do your own thing. Okay, so look what he's going to take with him, verse 40. He took his staff in his hand. Now, his staff would be the staff that he would use as a shepherd, wouldn't it? Uh, the staff was used for a couple different things. It could be used to, you know, to, to uh, whack a snake, you know, or a small animal and make them go away. It could be a, as a weapon. It could also be used to bring a sheep back to the fold, you know, because it had a hook on the end and they would use it lots of times to just grab a little lamb or a sheep and pull them in closer to the to the flock or to its mother or whatever. So he takes his staff, he's used to that, isn't he? And he took five smooth stones. Why do you suppose he took five? Five is a number of grace. Five is a number of favor. Plus the fact that later on it tells us that Goliath had four brothers. And evidently, David may have thought, man, I may have to fight five giants. So I'll be ready. I'll be ready. And, you know, as long as he understood that in those five stones was going to be the favor and the anointing of God, you know, he had it made, didn't he? And then he took, he put them in his shepherd's bag. He had a little bag or a, some kind of a, a thing that he could put the stones in. That's where he put them. And then he took his sling. He took his sling. Now I have a sling here that I got in Israel. It's been through the war, as you can see. My grandsons have used it for many, many things. <laughs> but this is what they were like. I mean, you know, we think of a slingshot, you know, with the, the thing with the rubber band kind of thing. Everybody, almost boys have made some kind of a sling like that. But this is what they use in Israel. It's woven, and you put this stone right here in the middle, and then, you put your thumb, of course, I'm going to be a great stone thrower here, you can imagine. You put your thumb around one of the ends here, and then you grab a hold of the other end. And then they swing these, and they let go of that, what's the other one? I can't do it. But anyway, you let go of this, uh, of the other end when you get it aimed. And I've seen young boys in Israel be able to just hit something right on target because they practice this all the time out in the fields. And, uh, and they, can, they can be really, really accurate with these slings and they use stones. So David was used to this. This was a, a, a weapon that he was used to. And that's what you need. You need to know some scriptures that, are, that you're used to, that are really yours, you know, that, are, that you can handle, not somebody else's. So he takes these things with him and in verse, uh, 43, verse 43. The Philistine sees David coming, and he said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? 
Mm. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Boy, you know, this is great, you know, great verbiage, isn't it? And then, look what David says. I love this. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. Now, think of those weapons. But I come to you, not with five stones, but what? In the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Mm. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord gives not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Wow. Now that should, that was intimidation. I mean, that should have been, you know, but of course the giant didn't listen to much of that. But anyway, what he's saying is, I'm going to cut off your head. Does David have a sword? No. No. How does he think he's going to cut his head off? But he has made a statement of faith. See, when you're going to come against the enemy, you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith in the word of God, in the Lord, and who he is. And he said, this battle is the Lord's, correct? Mm -hmm. It's not ours. It's not ours. We don't have anything to come, come with in, the, in this way. Actually, what David is saying here is a prophetic word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because it came to pass just like he said. And so David runs quickly. Uh, verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, ran, David ran quickly towards the battle to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Now, he would have armor down to his eyebrows. Mm -hmm. They say that these, some of these young men, these shepherds that know how to sling these slings, can throw it hard enough that a rock will go through the armor of a helmet. And that's evidently what happened. Now, it felled him, it knocked him down, and knocked him out. Whether he's dead or not, mm -hmm. I don't know yet. We don't know yet. But he falls down, and look at verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David, but David goes and stood over the Philistine and took his sword the Philistine sword, and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. He takes Goliath's sword, this one that weighed 23, probably 23 pounds, 23 pounds, and just chopped off the giant's head. Now, I want you to see something, though. In verse 54, before he gets the head chopped off, he stands over the Philistine. And that word stand there has to do with as a victor. He didn't stand there saying, oh my gosh, I wonder if he's going to come alive here. Did I really kill him? Maybe he's just knocked out. Maybe he's going to rise up and, you know, spear me or something. He didn't do that. He stood there as a victor, as a victor. And the word stand really meant that you went and you stood with your, your foot on the neck of the enemy. And you stood as a victor. Now, I want you to keep your finger here and go over to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. And Paul knew that we were going to be in battles, didn't he? And he wrote one of the most perfect things about how to stand against the enemy. Ephesians 6, verse 10. And this is written to believers, just like you and me. Weak as we are in our own flesh. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Look at that word, stand, against the wiles mm -hmm. of the devil. Before you ever go to battle, you've got to know you can stand. Because the very first thing the enemy will say is, well, who are you? Mm. You know, you're weak. You're just a nobody. Who, who do you think you are? You've got to be able to stand up against all of the lies that the enemy will try to tell you. 
Then it goes on in verse 12 and says, For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a spiritual battle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual battle. And let me tell you, people, we have enemies. We have oh, enemies. Yes. And, the, and the stronger you get in the Lord, the more the enemy hates you. That's right. But... It says then, look at verse 13, then take the whole armor of God, and by the way, the armor is only for the front of you. There's no armor for your backside, mm. so you can't run. You're running high. You're going to have to stand facing it. He says, stand, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore. How many times have we read the word stand? See, and that word has to do with stand as a victor with your foot on the neck of the enemy. So you're not standing there trembling saying, oh my gosh, oh dear, you know, I am so weak. I don't know whether this is going to work or not. No, you go and you stand because you know the power of God. And if you need more teaching on this, you need to get clothed in his righteousness. I've got a whole teaching on the armor. Then it goes on here and talks about, you know, continuing with the armor and all. And then go over to, um, go over to verse uh, 17, last part of 17. It says, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the word of God that causes you to cut the head off the devil. We don't come, you know, with some kind of, you know, great flowery speech or anything like that. You just simply say the word of God. Sometimes the best word is simply Jesus. Jesus. Because that covers everything, doesn't it? That mm. word is more victorious than any other word you could have in your vocabulary. Mm. But you've got to know him. You know, I mean, there's people who use that name <laughs> in bad ways. You know, mm. We're talking about using the name of Jesus as the final weapon because the enemies tremble at that name. They know that name. So let's go back to uh, Sa Samuel again. And let's look at um, um, verse, uh, where am I? Well, the last part of verse uh, 51. It says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The battle was over. The champion was done. See, lots of times we feel like everything is falling apart, don't we? We feel like the enemy's mm. coming at us from every way. And lots of times you have to come down, Where? what is the real battle here? What is it? Usually it's something against our faith. It's something that the enemy has put in our way to cause